Swinburne University of Technology. Hi everyone, welcome back to part two of the week two lecture. In the first part, when we looked at the distribution of marital status, we used the frequencies procedure and produced a frequency table and a bar chart. But when we looked at the distribution of time spent watching TV, we used the explore procedure and produced some descriptive statistics, percentiles and a histogram. So why the difference? Why did we use one procedure for one variable and a different procedure for the other? Let's have a look at what would happen if we used the explore procedure to produce output for marital status. This would give us a table of descriptive statistics where the mean marital status is 2.04. So what does that mean? If you think about the way marital status was coded, it was one for married, two for separated, three, divor three for divorced and so on. So what does a 2.04 mean? Does it mean that on average people were separated? That doesn't sound right. So calculating the mean for a variable like marital status just doesn't make any sense. Let's have a look at another variable. Let's have a look at time spent on housework. And we'll start by looking at what the frequency this would give us a table of descriptive statistics where the mean marital status is 2.04. So what does that mean? If you think about the way marital status was coded, it was one for married, two for separated, three, divor three for divorced and so on. So what does a 2.04 mean? Does it mean that on average people were separated? That doesn't sound right. So calculating the mean for a variable like marital status just doesn't make any sense. Let's have a look at another variable. Let's have a look at time spent on housework. And we'll start by looking at what the frequencies procedure output would look like for this variable. First, we'd get a frequency table. And that frequency table is so big it doesn't even fit on the page. Looking at that table doesn't give us any sort of impression of what the distribution of hours of housework looks like. The pie chart, really pretty, but doesn't tell us a thing. And if we look at the bar chart for hours of housework, it really doesn't give us a nice clear picture of what the distribution looks like. But if we look at the histogram for hours of housework, there we can see very clearly what the distribution of hours of housework looks like. So the histogram here would be a much better graph than the bar chart. So just to emphasize what the differences really are between histograms and bar charts, let's look at one more variable. So this variable is level of anxiety prior to the exam. And if you have a look at the bar chart, it looks like a fairly symmetric kind of distribution. But if you look at a histogram for exactly the same data, you'll see that there's this enormous gap in the middle, that there was no one in this data file that had an anxiety score between 17 and 25. So that didn't show up at all on the bar chart. But it's the most interesting feature of this distribution, that people either had very low anxiety or they had very high anxiety, and there was no one in the middle. So in the bar chart, if you look closely, you see that the, the bars are labeled 16, and then the next one is 25. There are no bars, 17, 18, 19, and so on, because there were no participants who actually had those levels of anxiety. So the bar chart, that really interesting feature of the distribution, the fact that there's a gap between 16 and 25, just doesn't show out at all. But it shows really clearly on the histogram. So how do we actually decide whether we should be using the frequencies procedure or the explore procedure? It depends on how the variable that we're dealing with was measured. So if you think about some of the variables we've looked at so far, variables like sex and marital status, for which we produced frequency tables and bar charts, were things that had just a couple of categories. So two categories of sex, male and female, five categories of marital status. These are what we describe as categorical variables. And for categorical variables, it makes sense to produce frequency tables, bar charts, maybe pie charts. That is, we should be using the frequencies procedure. But if you think about variables like time spent watching TV, which was measured in hours, then that's something that naturally occurs as numbers. It takes a whole range, a continuous scale of values. So variables that are naturally occurring as numbers are referred to as metric variables. So things like height in centimeters, age in years, temperature in degrees Celsius, time spent watching TV, they're all metric variables. And for these, we'd use the explore procedure and produce 
a table of descriptive statistics, percentiles, a box plot, and a histogram. Now, sometimes you'll make a mistake and you'll produce the wrong analysis. But if you have a look at your output and it looks crazy, like that pie chart with all those different categories in it, trust your instincts. You know that that looks wrong. You've used the wrong analysis. Have another thing and try again. So always, when you're looking at the SPSS output you produce, think about whether it makes sense or not. So in summary, for categorical variables, we use the, the frequencies procedure, and we have to request a percentage bar chart. For metric variables, we use the explore procedure, and we would request percentiles and a histogram. Now, in some textbooks, you'll find that people go a bit further than just describing data as being categorical or metric. They break it up into even smaller categories, nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio data. Really, though, most of the analysis, most of the choice of analysis is based on whether the data is categorical or metric. So these finer distinctions are not particularly important. One further thing that we should touch on, though, uh, measures of central tendency or measures of what's typical in a distribution and we've mentioned three as we've gone through our descriptive statistics there's the mode the mean and the median so the mode is appropriate for things like marital status for categorical data where the most typical value we said for marital status was married this was the most common category the mode is the most common the mode, though, is not very useful for metric data. Some people will look at a histogram and will choose the highest column and say, that's the mode for this distribution. Now, that's a really unreliable measure of what's typical in a metric variable. Because if you change the way the values are grouped in the histogram, it can change the modal class or the mode quite dramatically. So for metric data, you shouldn't be using the mode. You should be using either the mean or the median and which you use depends on the shape of the distribution. So let's go back to the distribution of hours of housework and have a look at where the mean and the median fall in this distribution. Here's the median and here's the mean. And if you look at the graph you can see that the median is a much better indication of what was a typical of the number of hours spent on housework. The mean is being unduly influenced by these few people that have extremely long times spent on housework. So if your distribution is skewed, the median will give you a much better representation of what's typical. If the distribution is symmetric, you would use the mean. So for categorical data, you'd use the mode as a measure of what's typical. For, for metric data, you'd use the mean if the distribution was symmetric, or the median if the distribution was skewed or if it had outliers. So there's one more topic that we need to look at this week, and that's the normal distribution. If we go back to the distribution of hours spent watching TV each day, here we've fitted over that histogram what we call a, no a normal curve. Now, the normal distribution is a symmetric bell-shaped curve, and quite a lot of variables follow that normal distribution quite closely. A normal distribution is really important in some of the theory underlying statistics, so we need to have a feel for what the normal distribution looks like. Now, the normal distribution has some really special properties. In a normal distribution, it doesn't matter what the mean of the distribution is or what the standard deviation of the distribution is, 95% of values fall within two standard deviations of the mean, which is really quite amazing. Uh, there are two other um, crucial values. 68% of values fall within one standard deviation of the mean, and 99.7% of values fall within three standard deviations of the mean. So let's have a look at that graphically. Here's a, a lovely normal distribution, symmetric and bell-shaped. The mean is in the center of the distribution here. And we know that 68% of the values will fall within one standard deviation of the mean. That's in that central blue section. And then 95% of values will fall within two standard deviations of the mean. And 99.7% of values fall within three standard deviations of the mean. 
So for any normal distribution, we can calculate something called a z-score. And the z-score measures the number of standard deviations from the mean. And then we can say that something is unusual if it's more than two standard deviations away from the mean. So if it has a z-score more than plus two or lower than minus two. This means that the score is outside that central 95% of the values. So going back to our histogram here, a value that had a z-score of 2 is over here at the top end of the distribution and there's only 2.5% of cases would be higher than that, would have values higher than that. Or a z-score of minus 2 would be right down here and only 2.5% of cases would fall below that. So to look at an example, let's look at the distribution of IQ scores. Now the mean IQ is 100 and IQ scores have a standard deviation of 15 and they're normally distributed. So suppose someone had an IQ of 135. Is that IQ score unusual? And if so, is it unusually high or is it unusually low? We could answer this by having a look at the z-score. So here's our formula for the z-score, value of interest minus mean divided by standard deviation. And the value of interest here is 135, the mean IQ score is 100, and the standard deviation of the I scores is of the IQ scores is 15. So we'd start by working out 135 minus 100 and that's 35 and then 35 divided by 15 gives us 2.33. Now that Z score is higher than 2. That means that this is an unusual value and it's a positive Z score so it means it's an unusually high value. This person had an unusually high IQ. Now we could also approach this by having a look at the graph of the distribution. So we could set up a distribution, a normal distribution. The mean is 100 at the center here, and the standard deviation is 15. So here's one standard deviation above the mean, 130 is two standard deviations above the mean. And our score of 135, that's outside that likely region. 95% of values would fall between 70 and 130. So this value of 135 is unusual or unlikely. It's an unusually high IQ score. So just as a checklist for week two, you should read through modules 1.4 and 1.5 in the textbook. You should watch the explore and frequency procedures in the SPSS videos on Blackboard. And you could, should complete topic test two. This has been a Swinburne production.